Yes, this uh, webinar is going live to our YouTube channel right now. So you can find it over there at youtube.com slash Vicon, or you'll get an email from Zoom also tomorrow that has the link to the presentation and then the materials. So we'll just give everybody another minute or so to join. We have the Q&A section open, so feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation and we'll answer those at the end. And our other webinar, our first Shogun webinar is on our YouTube channel as well. So that covers all the new features um, in the latest update. I was muted. Awesome. If, if um, people raise their hands, how do we answer their questions? Is it through through the chat? Um, yes. So the easiest way is to either message us. You can message both panelists or put your questions in the Q and A section. But it looks like that hand went down. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. So I think we'll get started. Thank you guys for joining us. This is our second Shogun webinar in our staff hosted series. So like I said, the first one is on YouTube. You can check that out after this. This is also on YouTube and will be available. Um, we've got some poll questions that we'll put up throughout to kind of gauge um, some of these features. And then we have the Q&A section open. So feel free to submit those. But we've got our product manager, Tim Doubleday, here again to walk us through Shogun retargeting. So Unless we have any initial questions, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alicia. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming by. Uh, I'm just going to roll the show reel to start with because I forgot to do it last last time we did this. And it's a nice kind of introduction to what our amazing customers have been working on. Yeah, so it just makes a nice introduction thing, and it shows the you know the amazing work you guys um, and all our customers have been doing. And I want to give them a special kind of shout out, really, because of the pandemic. 
and the fact that everyone's carried on working. Obviously, there's quite a big game coming out tomorrow that we're all very excited for. I know CD Projekt Red have been slaving away on Cyberpunk 2077. Um, so, yeah, obviously, massive congratulations for them. It looks absolutely stunning. I, I can't wait to play it. And, um, yeah, I think I'd also like to give some thanks out to people who contributed towards this webinar. I think got a lot of really good feedback off the back of the last one, which is more of an overview into... Uh, you know, new, the new features that we added to Shogun 1.5. In this particular webinar, I'm going to focus particularly on improving the quality of the animation in terms of the skeletal output. So the, um, let me just go to my slide. The first um, kind of thing we're going to focus on, oh, i go back to the beginning. Is being able to, um, look at the kind of different skeletons that we offer um, within, the, within the pipeline. So obviously we have our VSS and now we can support a custom FBX that we can retarget onto. That can be any character. As part of this demo, I'm going to be using a character that's been created using um, Character Creator 3 from Reillusion. We've been working with those guys to support a pipeline, not only taking the characters directly into Shogun, but also um, and unfortunately, we, we, I don't think we'll get to this in this demo, but being able to then uh, send the animation back into iClone um, so to, to kind of complete the loop. But a key kind of part of this is, is looking at the base pose and looking at how that, uh, not only of the, of the retarget, but also the Vicon skeleton and how you need to set up to get the best possible results. Um, we're then going to look at optimizing the solving skeleton. So... Um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but really that's about getting the best results out of the Vicon skeleton. So obviously we've got the relationship there with directly to the markers and making sure you get the best possible results. Um, optimizing fingers. So obviously we introduced uh, our high fidelity finger solver with Shogun 1.3 and we get a lot of feedback kind of saying, um, you know, how, how can we set this up to get the optimum solution, marker placement, um, the poses, trying to make make the kind of results look look as good as possible, and then finally, hopefully, with the, there's a lot to get get into, but we'll we'll get onto retargeting. Uh, I covered a little bit of retargeting in the last webinar, and um, yeah, like I say, if, if we have time, we can go into that into a bit more detail. But I think the key thing here, and it's something we've learned, particularly over the last uh, kind of year, really, is retargeting is great, but you need your starting your base result to be to be as good as it possibly can otherwise you're just fighting against things in the retarget so you know things like feet pull or, or hand position or, or finger solving all this stuff really needs to be fixed and kind of improved at the base level and then everything else kind of benefits from those improvements and uh, kind of to that point we'd we um i'd like to thank the guys at ea who have particularly given us a ton of really good feedback on on how we can do that and kind of um, this this is going to show a kind of manual way of, of improving the VSS but further down the pipe we hope to be able to give you some more kind of automated tools that will give you a much better base result. So the solving skeleton um, I'm going to I'm not going to kind of cover the the VST the labeling skeleton because that really is a a kind of it's, it's there just to label the data really. Um, I'm going to jump straight ahead into the into the solving skeleton because this is really the first stepping in point as to where we can make some improvements. And obviously, the the solving skeleton is designed to. You can see here it's got like lots of spine joints. Um, now we have the extra finger joints, and the neck joints, and so on. And it's it's designed to work with multiple marker sets. So you know, we introduce the production marker set which has the top shoulders and the back elbows and the uh, front knee markers. And then as part of this uh, data set that um, I'm going to share, but yeah, that's another thing to kind of highlight. All, all the stuff you'll see here will be available to download. So the data, the uh, modified VSS, and the retarget is obviously anyone can use Character Creator. So you're free to go and create a rig through that um, kind of system. Um, and the presentation itself, along with the uh, PowerPoint slides, will all be available to download. And I think the, the key thing here is we want you to be able to, to watch this, go away, and basically follow the steps 
and then the next time you run a shoot be able to have confidence that you can um, use these kind of suggested um, methodology and the, the kind of tips and tricks that I'll, I'll hopefully show you and I'm sure a lot of you know this already um, and I think that's probably it's maybe a good time to do the first poll which is really just a question asking do you currently as part of your pipeline um, use a modified VSS or are you happy with the Vicon skeleton so I don't know if Alicia wants to run that while I carry on yep just said that one live brilliant thanks Alicia So like I say, the VSS, it's the level that allows you to still have direct control between the skeleton and the markers. So we have a combination of different constraints, positional and rotation constraints, that define the way the markers drive the joints. Um, so I think it's important to allow customers to be able to make adjustments and you know at that level. Um, the base VSS, so the one that you pick in, in the drop down, whether you're using Shogun Live or Shogun Post, has this whole set of expressions. And these are there to allow for things like joint lengths to be calculated and joint centers to be calculated. And the kind of the idea behind it is to allow you to not be so stringent or accurate in terms of where you place your markers. So obviously, the shoulder markers. Um, you might place them at the front, they could be slightly inner, and really life subject calibration, these expressions, when you're doing the range of motion or when the actor's doing the range of motion, these joints tend to be calculated. Now that's great for some situations, but again, the, the feedback's been, well, actually, we'd, we'd rather use a more specific marker layout and say, right, we know when we place this marker, say, on the shoulder, we're making sure it's right on the joint, or when we're placing our ankle marker, it's, it's right on the ankle joint and so on. And this kind of um, custom VSS solution really, it relies on that. It relies on you knowing where the markers go and then you're using those markers as reference when you come to pose the skeleton. And yeah, it's just important to highlight, it's, it's fairly obvious, um, but it's you lose the ability to recalibrate the skeleton. So you can't say, you know, I've got a, a small actor, I'm gonna make these adjustments and then the next day or, or the following, the same shoot day you've got a taller actor comes in you can't reuse that vss but what you can do um, and i'll show this at the end is you can take say your actor a vss and modified load it back into shogun live and then basically regenerate a new labeling skeleton or vsk and use your updated vss and as long as the markers say from day one to day two to day three go back on in the same place because you know you've you spent a bit of time looking at that then you know that you're going to be using your modified VSS across that actor. And I think that's really where, where I'm pitching this. It's a, it's a modification per actor that you can then use across multiple shoots with the idea being that the actor, unless they're, unless they're going through a growth spurt, maybe they're a teenager, uh, the, <laughs> the actor won't be changing day to day. You know, the bone proportions won't be changing. Uh, so yeah, that's obviously the poll results. I think everyone can see them there. That's that's really interesting to see that. You know, I think the majority of people are either using the Vicon skeleton or um, or using it and are looking for um, improvements. So hopefully this this webinar is, um, is is a good time, perfect timing. Hopefully, okay. I'm going to close that. So yeah, as I mentioned, you can load it back into live and mark placement is very important. So the base pose. The base pose is the uh, rigging pose or the some some people call it the zero pose, but a zero pose is tricky because it's not always, the joints aren't, aren't always in a, don't have zero values. But the, the base pose is kind of the, the initial pose that we're gonna be looking at. And uh, you know, you. The, the pitch here is you have the opportunity to modify this, this base pose to your liking. So if I switch to Shogun Post here, this is a default, um, this is a range of motion da, 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 with our finger mark set. And um, thing to highlight, this finger mark set, this is actually what we were gonna show at GDC. 
and this this will get released like i say so you'll be able to test this but this mark set uses marks on the side of the fingers for the pinky and for the index and it removes the uh, ring end end marker and we kind of came up with this mark set because of the requirement to do sign language which is what this data is based on and what it allows you to do is kind of give a, a scrunched up fist and because the markers are on the sides of the fingers you can still you still get visibility with the cameras so the the pitch was the status cap um it's kind of a small system so using vero's or um you know 12 vero's to capture this for example that's kind of where we're pitching it so yeah like i say this is the um base calibrator result and you can see it's far from perfect so the the legs don't look great um, spine is kind of off to one side a little bit. The the hand position looks okay. If we have a, I know I'll be going into like the into more details in the finger placement. Um, yeah, you can see the the joints are pretty good on the fingers. They kind of match up. Uh, but the first step I'm going to do is, is basically show you the base pose. So to do this, I'm going to select the root, and then I go to my solving skeleton. If I right click, I can select all the other joints. So basically every joint in the rig. I'm just gonna unselect the hips because the hips have a rotation on them already. And then here in my channel editor, if I go to um, allow multiple selected, what this will do is any, any interactions I do down here with my channels will affect all the joints that I've got selected as opposed to this one, which will just do the first or the primary selected. And this one will do any joint um, within the within the file you've got open. So in this example, because I know what I've selected, I'm going to go here. And I'm just going to cut all the keys on my skeleton. And what this will do is basically set it into its base pose, which is this. So you can see this is a T pose. Um, that's, our, that's our base pose. We didn't, we didn't change the base pose although we did switch to an A pose for booting. And then what you need to do is just select the hips. And you can see here, it's got a rotation of 90 and X. So we just need to maintain that. You might ask, why do we have a rotation of 90 and X? And it is, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, argument. Obviously we supported Y up and Z up in our uh, workspaces and we've switched to just a Z up only solution. The idea being to kind of simplify the Vicon side of things to the point where really it's only when you go into the game engine or, or motion builder or whatever that you need to kind of consider the uh, world axis. So that any any step within the Vicon world is is um, agnostic to your orientation. The, the only caveat there is that the skeleton is uh, created or rigged as being Y up. So that's where you'll see a, a rotation there on the route. And I'll, I'll show you a little trick in uh, motion builder to um, to kind of deal with that. Okay, so so basically what I've done there is I've just zeroed the rotation on the other two channels. Now this is important, obviously, you need to make sure that your subject's standing correctly aligned along the um, world space. Otherwise, you're gonna have to kind of apply uh, rotation here. And to this point, I've seen a really nice setup um, at Rocksteady, uh, the guys there, they have a view camera set up in the ceiling and it's looking directly down on the center of the volume and where the actors stand for the calibration for the ROMs. And obviously you have the feet placement lined on the floor and there's an overlay on the screen. It basically just allows the actor to look at a TV and say, yeah, I can, I can see, you know, my left arm needs to come forwards a little bit. I need to rotate my hips and so on. And it is something to, um, something to consider. We weren't that, uh, we weren't on it that much here. So you can see there is a slight rotation here. If I go to the top view, you'll probably see a little bit more. So yeah, you can see the markers are just slightly rotated. So what I'm gonna have to do here is, is kind of make use of that rotation or account for it. Um, quick mention on when you're making changes to the skeleton, try and um, be in special manipulator mode. Obviously, if we are, if we're in normal rotation mode, it's going to be set in 
um, keys down here. Whereas if you're in special manipulator mode, if I uh, you know change a joint length, it's going to change the pre-translation or modify the base pose of the, of the skeleton, and that's kind of important within these setup changes. We don't want to be setting keyframes across our animation. And you, you can see if you've got a keyframe here, because this will go, um, it will change color to show that. And all you have to do, if, if that's the case, is just, again, cut, cut your keys. So I'm just going to rotate this. So, so that's put that, but it's not um, actually changing the base pose. That's on the root. And then the kind of recommendation here is really to align the hips and then look at the lower part of the body first. The reason we kind of recommend this is the hands and the arms are particularly tricky to line up or to, to get looking really nice. So obviously if, if you're changing the, changing the hands first and then all of a sudden you need to change the hips, all of a sudden everything kind of needs doing again. Whereas if you, if you get the lower part of the body first, then you can focus on finishing with the, with the upper body. It kind of makes a bit more sense. The, the other th kind of thing to consider here is just adding in a small um, rotation. We kind of recommend between three and five degrees into the legs. So if I, actually, I'm using mirror manipulator here, so it will apply it to both sides of the joint. So I'm just going to put in, let's do five. What this does is it just infers the rotation, the way the joint should rotate. So obviously the knees, we don't want them hyperextending as you saw in the, in the base calibration. So just by putting a small rotation in there, the system's going to know when the constraints are created or when the constraints are updated, that the leg is going to rotate that way around the, around the joint. So I've done that. I'm now going to kind of rotate the feet out and the twist. So you can see here, the legs are kind of slightly um, splayed or the feet are slightly splayed apart. Again, you, you could you could say, well, where's that rotation coming from? Is it coming from the ankles or is it coming from the upper leg? And I'm just going to assume it's coming from the upper leg. So kind of rotate the thighs out like so. Now feet, this is another area of um, contention really. So we added in this joint and this joint's really there to help with the mesh and trying to get the, the feet to look nice, which see, it's, it's no easy task. Um, this is this is a dummy joint, but you can change its pre-translation. So, oh, yeah. So here we go. So now it's now we've gone to actually modify the base skeleton. Shogun's telling us um, you're going to remove all those parameters. So this is the point of no return in terms of um, recalibrating the skeleton, like so. So yeah, you can you can change the length of this dummy joint, and what it's going to do is basically pull the feet into the floor. But any rotation value needs to go onto the ankle. So that's really just to visualize the, you know, the distance between the ankle and, and the floor. Um, the other thing I quickly wanted to say is in terms of the position or the length of these two joints, the upper leg and the lower leg, obviously it's all determ determined on the hips. And I think we all know hip marker placement is, is tricky at the best of times. You know, there's a lot of movement there from the suit. We've obviously got the upper part of the suit pulling with the, with the lower part of the suit. Um, just, just trying to know exactly where the hip joint should go is, is tricky. Um, so what, one of the tricks, um, Kim Duffy kind of told me today, she's, she's our life science product manager. And I asked her, well, is there a ratio between the um, femur and the tibia that we can kind of use as a, as a standard measurement and she shared some um, documentation which is part of the part of the uh, powerpoint but the uh, the kind of understanding is the the femur so the upper joint is about 1.21 times taller than or longer sorry than the tibia and the reason i say this is because from my experience you know when you're placing the knee knee marker and you're placing the ankle marker those things are much easier to say yep they're going directly on the actor because you can you can feel the feel the bone right so in this case what i would look to do is to kind of translate this joint up 
so it's in line with the knee marker. Don't worry, I'm going to kind of reposition the hips in a bit. And then here you can see here what this has done is it's pulled the um, ankle joint in line with the um, with the marker here. And then obviously we just need to extend the feet onto the floor. This is only really useful, by the way, if you're if your actor's wearing shoes where you know where the marks are, you know, if they're wearing boots or high heels, um, that's another kind of hurdle or consideration. And is it going to remember my script? Let's just go to script editor. Have you gone? No. So there is a get distance command. And basically what this can do is it will tell you the distance between two markers. So you can work out that distance and then obviously that will give you your tibia measurement and then you times that by 1.2 and it will give you the length for your femur. That's a kind of, if you were going to do a biomechanic approach, that's that's the way I'd be looking at it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately it didn't save my script. So I'd have to go out and, and, and dig that up again. But I think that's a nice kind of way of of calculating that. And then obviously it's giving you an est a better estimate as to where your hip joint should go, hip joint placement should go. Um, okay, so the other thing to do here is just to zero off the feet. So obviously I've rotated the legs out. I'm now gonna just make some adjustments here to kind of flatten the feet onto the floor. Again, we're in mirror manipulate mirror manipulator mode, but you know, not everything's going to be mirrored. So it's important to make sure if you are using that mode that both things are left and right look correct. I can just see here, this needs to come in a smidge. That's looking pretty good. Okay, so assuming that we've kind of looked at those measurements of the, of the femur and the tibia, now the challenge is uh, placement of the hips. And again, obviously we've zeroed the rotations and uh, added in this five degree kind of hint as to where the joint should go. So the legs are essentially straight. Now we're assuming that the actor had straight legs in the T-pose. Obviously they're not gonna be locked out. Um, hopefully they're not kind of too relaxed into the pose. But what this should allow us to do is then move the hips back to the point where the ankle marker lines up confidence in that marker in terms of its placement and skeleton and likewise here. So again, it's not straight on the joint, but you can see the front knee knee marker here kind of is. So that's the kind of um, considerations when you're when you're positioning the hips. So I'm gonna assume that I'm happy with those changes and I'm now just gonna select both the joints and then down here I'm gonna select branch so it selects the the chain underneath and then if I right click and choose update solving constraint offsets what you'll see is all the targets the little squares um, snap to the position of the markers and that means that the the target is going to use this current frame uh, in, in terms of when it when it's um, focusing on, on how to fit the skeleton to the markers I think I quickly want to the highlight here is we added interactive solving um, to the skeleton. What this is quite nice to do is I found is if you just kind of want to use the feet, you can use interactive solving to um, position the, the base of the foot. So if I turn on mirror mode again, um, interactive solving is great, but it's, you know, you've got to bear in mind what it's doing in the background. It, it is trying to fit the whole skeleton to the um, to the marker cloud. Um, so if I turn this on, so it looks like it's actually pretty good. But you can see here, it just allows you to modify the bone length and make sure that your the soles soles of your feet on the floor nicely. Okay, turn that off, and you can see what it's done is it's. Um, it's updated the positions here. So you have to go and zero those again. It's fine. Like so. Okay. 
Um, I really wanted to cover the base pose and our spine. And I appreciate not everyone's a fan of a curved spine. You know, animators I've worked with in the past are more accustomed to having a straighter spine. Again, I think there's there's an argument to have a slight bend in the spine just so that the solver knows the um, rotation. But you can see here, if I go through, we we have um, pre-rotation values here on our on our skeleton, and there's nothing stopping you. Um, again, even if you wanted straight straighter um, hips here, you could actually change the pre-translation on this joint if you wanted to, which you would do like so if you wanted like completely flat um it's up to you really you know i think one of the key takeaways from this webinar is these tools are available to you you know we hope there's more flexibility here than maybe some other other solutions out there um that allow you to kind of get the optimum result and the way you'd expect it to be delivered so in this example i'm just going to set this to five and i'm just going to go up the up the skeleton i'm going to take these off so you can see here now it's there's no pre-translation in z and there's a small rotation on the spine as a kind of hint to how it should rotate the same up here and actually here i'm gonna because i've taken that curve out i'm going to straighten the spine up show that the the shoulders are going to line up better okay so exactly the same rules and reasoning can be used on the clavicles. Again, I know not everyone's a fan of the way our clavicles are placed. You know, anatomically, yes, maybe the clavicle, though, you know, the clavicle is a big bone and it does, you can feel it, it comes out there. Um, but in terms of an animator or even a, a you know, a mocap TD, whatever, if you want those to be um, moved, you can do. So I'm going to jump in mirror mode, so it doesn't matter. You can just rotate those back. Oh, that didn't work. Uh, what happened then? Oh, it's, I think it's because it's flipped. So I'm going to have to do one at a time. Take off mirror mode. Yeah, obviously, we can't define the left and right clavicles are essentially going in opposite directions. So if I take this off, so you can see here, I'm changing the pre-translation of that joint rather than the, um, rather than setting a key because I'm using the special manipulator. So I'm just going to rotate these back and then it's nice to do is just kind of set it to a equal number so that then when I go and do the other side, I know what's going on. So in fact, I'm actually going to pull that back a bit more. Cool. So now it's looking a little bit more like a, maybe a game rig that you've worked on or or yeah, something something you might see in motion builder, I guess. And yeah, like I say, I think I think the thing here is you, you appreciate the mesh is going to get distorted, so you can you're less reliant on how the mesh looks. There's nothing stopping you from reskinning the mesh if you want to a new base pose. But we've kind of got a much. It's still a slight curve, but a kind of straighter spine, and our clavicles are straight. You can see our shoulder markers line up. And because this is an A pose, obviously what we can now do is go in and pose the arms. Go turn, uh, mirror manipulate back on. So because the arms are, are in an A pose, you've got to assume the shoulders are going to be slightly sloped. And I think it's worth highlighting here, There's, and the arms are really tricky to get right, but there's nothing stopping you from using a different pose to position the arms. Obviously, we've used the legs here because they were kind of straight, um, and we updated constraints. But what you could then do is go and find another pose, whether it's a T pose or a, you know whatever, 
I could prayer pose if you want and adjust the arms accordingly based around that. So I'm just going to turn off constraints. So the arms are tricky, like I say, and the, the main the main thing is really because, especially in the T pose, you don't really know how much rotation there is or how much twist there is about the about the upper arm or about the clavicles. So I think our kind of advice is to is to kind of position the shoulder marker correctly, which I think it kind of is. Um, another thing is the length of the clavicles. So again, you know, if you have high confidence that this uh front marker is exactly where you think the joint placement should be and there's nothing stopping you from from setting that you know changing the bone length so it fits exactly uh, the same here so obviously we've had to pull the clavicles back and another little trick i think probably everyone knows this but um for those that don't plus minus keys help you scale the manipulator and that also works in Shogun Live now. So if you're positioning in a prop route, you can use the manipulator and plus and minus keys to help achieve that. Yeah, I don't know. Do we want to do some questions maybe as I'm going along, Alicia? Yeah, we have two in now. Let's do it. Well, um, the first bit. one. From Carl, do you have any updates on the release of the Unreal Vicon Live Link plugin? Ah, <laughs> not related to this. Um, we do, it's coming. Um, we have a build we're just testing internally, and we hope to have a release out in the coming week, I would say. Not, not to put too much pressure on my fellow product manager, whose job <laughs> it is to release it. <laughs> and then Mark asked Does interactive solving sacrifice software stability while working? Um, it's a good question. It's not stability, but it is computationally heavy. So it is going to require a fairly beefy PC to run. It's, it's basically running the whole, we have a globally optimized solver, you know, so, so all the markers are driving all the joints. And when you turn those features on, you are going to see a, a kind of performance hit. Um, like I say, I think, I think it has benefits in certain use cases and I probably wouldn't be having it on all the time. Um, but it is useful for doing things like, you know, if you want to just add a change the length of the legs and see how it's going to affect the rest of the skeleton. Or likewise, if you want to adjust the spine joints, the length there and see it update straight away. Rather than having to go through and update constraints, I think there is, there is benefits there. The, the thing we're kind of looking at is being able to support interactive solving with rotation. So being able, like I'm doing here, basically been able to say right i've positioned these joints now i'm gonna i'm gonna rotate this hand joint and as soon as i let go of the manipulator it will update the whole solver for you and it will show you you know all the fingers will snap for example as, as though you're updating constraints and i think that that should add an extra benefit to that system cool does anybody else have questions at this point So yeah, I'm going to turn off that manip manipulator because you can see I posed this this hand. Actually, what I'm going to do here is, again, just add a slight bend to the joint because we know how hard it is for your, for your arms to be completely straight. And I'm just focusing here on the wrist markers. I'm, I'm kind of ignoring the finger markers for now. Um, you'll see when I update constraints, I'm only going to update constraints on the on these arm joints, I'm going to leave these alone and let the kind of the finger solver deal with those. A neck and a head. It's not bad. It looks again. It's tricky now because the mesh, the mesh isn't really um, representative of um, of the skeleton because we've we've kind of changed the base pose. Um, but I am just going to rotate that back a little bit. As you can see here, so the the uh, C7 marker lines up a little bit better. Maybe that's a bit too far. So yeah, I think our advice with the hands is um, 
you know, use the apos if, if you think it's beneficial and then go and find a, a better pose, maybe where there's a bend in the, in the elbow or like I say, a prayer pose where you know the hands are going to be flat and then make further adjustments from there. For the time being, we're kind of, you can see these two markers are floating away from the, uh, from the joint. But we, yeah, again, you can only really assume that the that the arms are straight in this example. So what I'm going to do now is um, just go through and update those constraints that I've that I've modified. And I think because I changed the hips, I'm going to have to do all of them. Yeah, so you can see here this slight offset on the hips in that axis. So I think the best way to do this is to because I don't want to update my fingers. Let's just extend that out. Yeah, I'm just pressing F, similar to mine. Now you press F here and it will focus on, on your selection. So if I go here, select branch, uh, is that gonna work? No. And again, so I've just held shift there to um, expand everything. It's probably a better way to do this, but here you go. So I wanna make sure that the hand here, which I have aligned, is gonna update or roughly aligned. I can go in and go in and tweak that. Um, so if I, I want to make sure that the other fingers aren't going to update because obviously it's in a it's not in a pose that's representative of the marker positions. Okay, that's fine. Take one out. Okay, so that's updated all the um constraints for the joints i've got selected or the joints i've um sorry adjusted and now yeah so if i go to interactive solving you can see now the hands will snap back because none of those targets were updated and again to the to the question about performance you can see here it's not bad i mean this is a this is our new advanced spec pc and it's it's doing a pretty good job of running the solver in real time Obviously, once I load in, I retarget and have both, and it's like it's another layer. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely benefits to using this um, using this feature. And like I say, with rotation coming, I think there'll be even more reason. Okay, so quickly to look at the fingers. Like I say, I think the um, the calibrator's done a pretty good job here. Uh, but if you did want to go in and change anything, the, the kind of things you can do is you can change these pre-translations. Um, so these are the, met the length of the metacarpals, the kind of joints across here. And, you know, again, I think having reference footage, excuse me, reference video, or um, again, knowing where those marks are placed is, is really helpful. So if it's, if it's static photos showing you where the marks are in relation to where the, where the joints should be going, we recommend for, for the finger solver to place the marker in the middle of each phalange. So kind of on here and then on here, obviously based on the marker set. That's where the calibrator is looking for uh, those markers to be. You know, that's where all the training data that, that's been learned through the through the finger solver that's that's where the markers were placed um likewise for these inner and outer hand markers it's expecting those markers to be the same size as the finger markers so in this example i think it was nine millimeter markers were used wrist markers aren't aren't so important and what that helps determine is the um the rotation or the kind of offset of where the joint is placed in relation to where that marker sits on the hand. So obviously you don't want to draw the joint straight through the marker because it's markers on top of the finger or on the side of the finger. And so you can see here, and this is, again, it's another thing you can kind of, you can play with. So you can, uh, you can rotate this joint. It says, and kind of 
position it again because we've thrown away the expressions we're now using a custom skeleton you can um you can make changes to this hand setup and actually to that point i can show you so i've just created some really simple scripts which one do we want scale metacarpals Here we go. So all this script's doing, again, I'll share this so you can have access to it. It's loading all the um, metacarpal joints into an array. It then goes through and works out the, or gets the pre-translation for each joint, and it will go through and apply an offset. So it's four millimeters in this example. And the reason I've kind of come up with this is because generally what I've found is, you can just see, see what it's done there. It's kind of scaled these back the the calibrator will sometimes move the or the joint center for the metacarpal this one will be quite far forwards and what this means is then when you're getting a kind of bend on your fingers everything is either clawed or too straight obviously you, you really want to get the best fit for the for the joint placements on the fingers to get the get the best animation. I mean, that sounds obvious, but it's, again, it's no easy thing to do, you know, to make assumptions in terms of where the marks are placed. So you can kind of scale this and this will just scale everything back by four millimeters. And again, you can do the same thing on, um, I think I've got interactive solving on, so it's, you're seeing that update live, which is kind of cool. So it's not bad. I mean, that mark is in, in between, that's, that's where it's placed and so on. I think maybe this first phalange looks a little bit long. So again, I just duplicated. Same script, different joints. This will just change the bone length of this first phalange joint. Pull it back a little bit. Like so, you can see the fingers update there. Thumb's particularly tricky. Um, and it's worth noting, it's something we're kind of we're always looking to improve uh, the, the thumb placement. Obviously, you've got a um, three degree of freedom rotation on here. And then the way the thumb is placed and rotated is, is tricky at the best of times. I guess it's worth noting there's nothing stopping you from changing the this distance here. So if you've got like a, I don't know, like a very thin wristed subject, um, you, you can change those values. You can see here it's pretty good in terms of placement with the marker. Um, and there's nothing stopping you from rotating individual joints. Bring this back down. Come on. Is that not working? Probably somebody's screaming that I'm doing something wrong. I don't know why that can't be rotated. Oh, oh it's because I've got interactive solving. I'm sorry. So that's the feature we're adding: <laughs> it's the ability to um, rotate the joint and then release it and see everything update. So now what I've got to do, I've rotated it and just update solving constraint. And then when I turn on interactive solving again, it will um, it will update everything for you, like so. So yeah, you can change the bone lengths, you can update constraints. I think the thing thing worth noting is if you update constraints, it's no guarantee that you're going to be given that pose on that particular frame because it, with two things, it's a, it's a globally optimized solver. So everything's kind of pulling against each other. So there's, yeah, there's no guarantee. And likewise with the finger solver, what it's actually doing is it's got like this idea of a plausible pose or a, a kind of a, a correct a correct frame a correct pose from the animation and if the if the target is pulled with um outside of that kind of area or zone it's not it's going to kind of snap back and give you what it, it thinks is a plausible um pose to the animation so it's just something to bear in mind when you're when you're posing the skeleton the other thing and i don't think we need to do it here because the you can see here like the mid finger is it's lined up nicely. Like I say, these ones are on the side, so I'd expect these markers to be. That's looking. It's looking pretty nice. 
but there's nothing stopping you from setting a pre-rotation on the joint. So I don't know if you say, I know that the, uh, that I need this to be aligned and this, and the solve is not allowing me to do it. You can set a pre-rotation, but again, I changing that you could see multiple fingers are updating because it's all kind of interconnected. And the last thing I wanted to highlight here was um, degrees of freedom, which I'll come on to when I focus on retargeting. Um, but there's no twist on the hand. So if you're going to rotate, but sorry, if you're going to apply twist here, you need to apply it to the elbow, elbow joint, and then update, update constraints on this joint. Like so. Okay, so I think that covers the, the kind of the base pose and updating the solve. If I come out of here now, and I'll just run. Solving, are there any questions while we're letting it do its thing? Yeah, it looks like we have three in the queue. Um, if you can see those or I can read them. Uh, yeah, sorry, let me pull them up. Why was the finger multiplier? Oh, why was the finger multiplier setting recently removed? Um, the finger multiplier was part of the old um, five by three setup, and that parameter just isn't isn't used at all anymore. So now, like I say, it's using this idea of a plausible pose. So we've trained the trained the solver based on a whole set of different captures across different size hands and different size subjects and so on. And now the idea is any any of the results fall within that um, data set. So even when you're doing five and three, or when you're using the three marker set, the the way the middle fingers are derived are derived from the train data, not just a kind of assumed um, variable, which is which is what it was before, right? It was just a multiplier. Um, Neil Medu, hey Neil, how's it going? Um, is it possible to import any rig and characterization like Motion Builder? Yes, exactly. So I think the last webinar we did, I, I was using the um, Unreal Mannequin, which I'd imported in from um, Unreal, obviously, but <laughs> I'd imported it via Motion Builder. So I have like a Motion Builder character set up. Um, I'll get onto retargeting, but the nice thing about the retargeter is you can uh, once you've created your setup, you can reload it across multiple characters so that you can very quickly, uh, you know, take a new character, as long as it's got all the same bone names, which in the case of Motion Builder, we will be using Human IK. You can just have like a Human IK VSR or retarget file and use that across all your different characters. So it very quickly allow you to retarget within within Shogun. And yeah, like I say, hopefully we will have time. I can get onto this kind of neat trick that the guys in Excel shared with me about showing how you can use the Vicon stream to stream directly onto your game character rather than use or target skeleton, sorry, rather than use our intermediate uh, rig. So this is done. Um, let's see. So we've got a question from Vita. Will there be a marker template solver update allowing a third shoulder marker on top? Yes, so that is out. That's the production marker set, uh, which I can't remember when it got added. Maybe 1.3, maybe 1.4, I want to say. Um, and that has the extra marker on the top. It has the knees brought around to the front. The, the kind of the reasoning for bringing the knee knee mark around was we were seeing lots of swaps between the inner knee markers, particularly uh, in in Japan where you, we have like these uh, a lot of our customers are doing big dance troops. We have lots of characters, anime characters, all dancing, and there's kind of like this classic pose where the knees come together. Um, and yeah, the feedback was, well, can we move those markers? And yeah, we, so we've positioned them around to the front. And then the last one, again, very similar reasoning was the elbows. So this marker here, back elbow, is actually kind of designed to go here on the back of the elbow, not on the, uh, where are we? There, on the inside of the elbow. And 
yeah, again, the reason for that is to, to help with swaps. Now, again, it's up to you. Um, I hope that answers your question. And yeah, the, the, obviously the top marker here will help with um, will help with solving. But again, it's, it's a nice segue into looking at the constraint weights. The um, we have like this core set of markers, which you can probably tell are in in the base um, base skeleton, which are the kind of important ones. And when I say important, I just mean they have a higher effect over the skeleton. Um, and that's really, those are the markers that are, you know, important. It's important where you place them. They have a greater influence on the skeleton and so on. But there's nothing stopping you from saying, I don't know, like there's, we've added in this lower back markers, for example, and you think, right, I, I know that they're going to really help with my spine solve, for example. So I'm going to change the weight of those markers and kind of weight them up. And from our kind of experience, again, because it's a global solver, you've got to be aware that if I go in and I change, for example, the foot weight, it's going to have an effect on the hands. Everything's going to, everything's going to get pulled. Um, if I suppose this, generally a good frame in your range of motion to notice it. It's these kind of arm pulls. And what you'll see is the feet will get pulled. So you can see it's happening a little bit there. If I zoom in. So you can see the, um, the joints going up and the the kind of the ankle marker isn't. <laughs> uh, so we can just turn on interactive solving and we'll see the live update. I'm going to find the kind of the extreme of that. So it's going to be as the hands coming straight up. What I can now go and do is look at my constraint weights down here I could say set this to a thousand and it's going to change the effect that that marker had where's it gone that didn't that did the opposite to what I was thinking um because right, I set it to 100 um that's going to have the the kind of effect there you go so it's pulled it back down of of giving precedence or or importance to that marker driving that joint over the rest of the skeleton. And I think the key thing here to acknowledge is, you know, we've got another, I don't know, 15, 16 joints here in the in the hand. Um, sorry, it's my phone ringing. That's embarrassing. Should be on silent. Um, so we've got now other 16 joints per hand that's affecting the whole body. So the the solvers having to calculate those 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 joint rotations and so each joint here has a different weight in itself so you can see if i go up to the hands each one has a, a kind of position value of one so it's, it's not a lot of influence but it is going to have an effect over the rest of the skeleton but yeah so to go back to my, to go back to my point if, if you see that kind of example there and we'll probably see it on the other side when she raises this arm what you can do is go in and adjust the the weights and the, i think the heel one and the lmt ones are, are good examples so where are we these ones and yeah so that's just going to help pull that down like so and it's the same on the hands so Obviously, it's, it's if you've got a well calibrated skeleton and the joints are in the in the correct place, you're going to get less of this issue because there's going to be less pull. Um, but let's say you're seeing a um, pull on the hands. Then there's nothing stopping you from going in and changing those weights. So yeah, you can see here the the con the constraint where it thinks or it's trying to place the markers to where it is has kind of shifted and what you can do is then go and find that constraint i've got the selection turned on um go and change it and then change the constraint weights so it is going to be this one so it's got five let's go crazy set it to 100 there you go 
So it's, it's now it's going to make sure that that hand is matched exactly, and I'll go and do the other side. That one. Strange. That one. There you go. So again, obviously that is going to affect the whole skeleton. So you, you need to go through and make sure those changes aren't going to and negatively affect things. I mean, I'd suspect there if I'm making sure the hands match, what it's going to do is it's going to start pulling the upper body, the the spine and the clavicles. So that's that's the kind of trade off. But yeah, I hope you agree. It's looking, it's looking pretty good. I think it's looking like a better base to start your retarget. And I think that's really, really where we're pitching this. It's 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 getting that optimum starting point before you start looking at retargets. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back to the presentation. So I think I went through all these in the demo, but also you can zero all the joints, which will show you the base pose, um, flat flatten the clavicle, um, straighten the spine. It's important to understand pre-rotation and post-rotation. So use a special manipulator, and obviously um, you're you're removing all the expressions. So you're you're essentially changing the the base pose, which is then going to uh, modify the mesh and joint mod uh, joint lengths can be modified. But we we kind of think live subject calibration does a pretty good job. And then optimizing the solving. Just to recap, on the lower body again zero all the joints align the root, and then work down. Um, hip position, so this is the kind of the ratio between the two joints. Um, again, I'll, I'll dig out that script and share it. It's, it's really straightforward. Um, but it just allows you to have more confidence in terms of where your hips are being positioned. Um, the dummy joint is obviously really just to show the mesh and where the floor intersection is. Uh, adding bend to key joints, so the knees and the elbows, just so that the solver knows which way it should be rotating. And then place the hip marker so that the ankle, uh, sorry, the hip joint, so the ankle joint matches the ankle marker, if that makes sense, with, with that kind of five degrees bending. And then rotate the legs out from the, from the thighs. And then the upper body, so we went through, we straightened the spine and still kept that curve in. We flattened the clavicles to help align the shoulder markers. Um, oh yeah, so one thing I didn't show actually was the posing. So if I go back, you probably saw in the ROM, we have a this prayer pose. So this is a good secondary pose if you want to have a look at your uh, actual bend in the arm. And just to make sure that the the markers are lining up, so you can see here it's, just, it's doing a pretty good job. The back elbow marker, oh, it's this one. Back elbow marker is is pretty plumb on where the um, back of the elbow is. The inner elbow. I mean, again, the mesh you might want to rotate that in, so there's nothing stopping you from going to special mode later. Gonna come out of interactive solving mode. Just gonna rotate that in a smidge so it's sitting exactly on, and then update just that joint so it's only going to affect those ones. And then the rest, you know, further down the chain, it will fix itself. Turn interactive solving back on, and then basically, it's you know, it's you're not setting keyframes. You're you're literally updating the constraints. So. All the inf all the information for that constraint on frame one is now gone. Uh, it's not it's not animating between the weights. And yeah, you can see now that the obviously it's it's doing a much better fit on that elbow within that pose. Hey Jeremy, how's it going? Can we still key mark rates? Yes, you can if you want to. So sorry. 
the the question was can we key weights so you can key uh retarget weights if you want to essentially do um you know motion edit onto your retarget skeleton or you could um key solver weights on the on the vicon skeleton if you want uh, yeah, and a, another question about degrees of freedom. So uh, we'll get onto this a little bit more with the retarget skeleton. Um, the rotation order. Oh, that's a good question. So not degrees of freedom, the actual rotation order. Hmm. I thought they were all X, Y, Z, but are they not? Ah. I don't know to be <laughs> to be honest. Um, I assume it's because they have degrees of freedom on. You want to consider certain orders first. There you go. Thank you. Um, you know, in, in terms of how you're solving that that joint, um, but that's a good question. I, I will I will go and ask um, a developer as as to why that is. Again, from my experience, it's to either remove you know, like gimbal flipping or to basically allow you to solve a certain axis first. So in, in the example of the elbows, you know that you're only bending around these two axes. But it's interesting that X comes last when X is your primary rotation joint. Yeah, sorry, that only answers a little bit of your question. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that was basically showing that you can make further adjustments on on other poses to the skeleton. If I go back here, uh, straighten the arms, position the wrists. Yeah, like I say, I just rotated the hand and then didn't update constraints on the rest of the fingers and allowed the um, finger solver to do that. And again, moving on to fingers. So joint placement is tricky the you know the guide is like i say to put the marker in the middle of the phalange to get the best results and i, I guess on that point if you have a a requirement or a marker set you think would be better than the ones we currently ship you know we do the three the five and the ten and this one will be shipping this is the nine sides we're calling it uh, but if you have a marker set um you'd like to us to consider and just send me an email the, the chances are it's within our data sets. I don't know if you've seen our previous presentations, but we have we the training data has like 58 markers on on each hand. So chances are your marker set should fall within that set. Um, I know, for example, um, I had a request for three a three marker set where the markers are on the third phalange on each finger rather than the second phalange to try and give you kind of more more fidelity without having uh, kind of b burden on cleanup. Obviously, the reasoning between putting the second phalange is there's going to be less occlusion, but it's it's all about kind of what will work for you in your productions. So yeah, just send me an email. And um, there's no twist, so any twist is applied to the forearm. And yeah, I didn't have it in this example, so I'm not really <laughs> not to really train it correctly. But good reference is useful. Obviously, we've added support for SDI cameras. Get a nice uh, 4K. Black Magic camera just focused on the hands for your hand range of motion, and you should be able to get some really accurate results. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll share all those scripts for scaling scaling the various finger joints. Um, yep, the the markers should be the same size, but obviously, if you're if you're not using the calibrator, it's really up to you then to say, actually, I've got fifteen mil markers on my knuckles on my on my hands. And then you just rotate the joint into the correct position. Um, yeah, and the markers are expected in the middle. And then, yeah, if you want to change pre-rotations, you can do. That's going to be the one way you can actually apply an offset to the solver if, if it's not giving you exactly what you want. And I think, like I say, there's, we know Fingers is new for us. Um, we know that there are challenges with that solution, and, and we, we're constantly working on... A getting a better result out of the base calibrator, and then also um, in terms of the poses that it's producing, and kind of allowing allowing the user to 
to have a little bit more control over that rather than just a multiplier, for example. Um, yeah, and updating constraints, it's not going to give you that exact pose. It's, it's if it falls within the training set, then there's a better chance, but it's not. There's no guarantee. And then finally, we just went through the constraints and the weights. So being able to change the values, and I think another thing to to highlight here is fairly obvious. You know, we have some weights that are 0 0.1, and then we have some weights that are 5,000 or 1,000. And there's definitely a, a task for us to go through and make those a little bit easier to understand. Um, you know, Motion Builder has sliders uh, going between 0 and 1, or I think it's 0 and 1. And I, th I think something like that, especially with retargeting, makes it a lot more user friendly. At the minute, you're kind of you're setting one value at 0.1 and another one at 5,000. It just doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, oh yeah, and this last one is interesting. I don't know if we saw it in the data so much, but oh, it's a little bit. Sometimes you'll see, particularly when the subject's crouched, or maybe that extreme twist pose might show it. You'll see a kind of compression in the neck Move that out of the way. Again, with with um, with good joint lengths, this this is less of an issue. But but kind of from my experience, what I have found is, if you're seeing compression here, you can actually change the weights or lower the weights on the on the head. So at the minute it's two hundred, you know, sit that down to hundred or even fifty, and it will still do a really good job of of placing the head correctly you're not going to get like a floating floating head but what it will do is just allow it to kind of go up and down a little bit and remove that um kind of unwanted compression that you that you can often see on the spine and back um it's interesting we've got a current project looking at using the same methodology so a pca based um trained data set on the spine to, to kind of only give you valid um spine results um, so that will be coming in a future version of Shogun, which is quite exciting. But it uses, it uses the same idea. Uh, yeah, so that covers that. And then, yeah, I just threw this one in because it came up <laughs> on a call yesterday. And I'll be honest, this is something that um, I haven't really experimented much with. But you, there's nothing stopping you from changing the actual constraint type. So if I... Select constraint, and the and the example was was the head. So, so here it's position, right? It's going to try and match the position of the joint to to the markers and use all the head markers. But you could change this to um, a point at, for example, knowing that the the head joint is always going to point at those markers as opposed to try and fit it. And in some cases, you know, particularly on an end effector. That might actually give you a uh, give you a better result. So it's, it's just something to bear in mind. I guess the, the the key thing is there's flexibility within the system. It's really I think hopefully all the tools are there now, adding things like interactive solving, and it's just making it easier to use. Okay, so that should cover constraints and weights. Now onto retargeting. So this character, like I say, has come from Relusion, which is down here, no work. I don't know if you've come across this before, but it's, I don't know, <laughs> kind of, I was amazed at the quality of the assets and uh, that, you, that you get for free, really. I think this is what well, I say free. It's, this is a, there's a trial and, um, but you know, it's not a lot of money. Let's put it that way. I think it's, it's a kind of good value proposition. If you're looking to very quickly get a, a high quality asset, and this is just a character that I came up with. It's a bit like playing, um, well, let's say playing Cyberpunk tomorrow when you're creating um, your version of V, making sure she's wearing uh, biker boots and, uh, and an orange skirt. But um, the nice thing is you just, you know, you can go in and pick pick your character, set their shoes, blah, 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 um, and then just export. And you can export directly to Motion Builder. So if I do FBX close character, here you have my motion builder. Uh, it has Unreal, so you can 
you can basically spit out the Unreal skeleton, so all the um, joint orients are different, and so on. And what that allows you to then do within Shogun, if I go to retargeting, you can see here, I've got a labeling skeleton, I've got a solving skeleton. Um, and I covered this a little bit in the last presentation, so I won't go into it in full. If I go to my skins folder, here's the FBX that I've exported. Uh, I think it was this one, sample female. So yeah, to uh, to Neil's question, you can load load the FBX directly into Shogun now. And what it's going to do is it's going to hopefully know that it's a retargeting skeleton as opposed to a um, you know to a static mesh because it's got the bones in there. And what it's done here is it's placed it under a retargeting node. Now it it won't do this for every rig. It's basically looking at certain topologies of skeletons so you might find your skeleton gets loaded and it's kind of separate it's, it's sitting down here um but it's very easy to go in all you have to do is select your character at the top in this case celia and then go objects create objects uh action prop and create a rug retargeting setup there at the top and that will just create this node for you da -da 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 here and then you select the rig and parent it to the to the retargeting node and then Shogun will know that it's a character that's going to be used for retargeting but yeah it depends on your on your rig layout but but hopefully we'll catch most most of them so what this allows us to do now is if I go to retargeting here we have our character you can see it's loaded it in with the a pose it's quite nice in character creator you can actually specify the Pose that it's exported at. I think somewhere posed. Oh, there's, de there's definitely a way anyway. So you could you can have a T pose. You can um, zero the fingers, for example, and set it up in a kind of pose that you can then use for for your retargeting. And to go through this quickly, the the key thing here is now that we've loaded our character, obviously. We have the skeleton, which is in here. This skeleton's a little bit funky in the way that it's got a, it's got like basically it's got hips and then it's got a pelvis that sit on top of each other, which is fine. Uh, so if I go here and I just, I'm gonna hide the mesh. So a couple of things here with the FBX, you can select joints that you don't need to see and uh, just click showing here and turn it off again similar to the channels if you have um, this button selected it will do it on all your selection and uh, it's kind of a quick way to, to clean the joints up the other thing is these joints they're obviously the way it draws the joints it's all facing towards the camera um, but if you'd rather rotate the joints what you can do so if i just select all these we have this advanced attribute where is it uh, here joint twist and you can change this and it will just sh um, rotate the visibility of that joint down the axis so it's easy obviously if you're trying to um you know look at look at the way the joint's going to rotate knowing that that's the up vector for that joint is handy so on i think this is the opposite like so and then in here, because the the rig's been associated to Celia, uh, actor or actress, all the joints are loaded in here. Now, as I say, if I show you this, so again, I don't know, I'm not, I'm no rigger, but um, I have seen rigs like this in the past, so it's, it's not unique. But basically, you've got the hips here, which are, um, you know. For this setup, that's where I'm going to apply the translation and the rotation. And then I've got this pelvis joint, and I've, then I've also got the waist, which the waist is, is the spine. Um, so in this example, I don't want to be applying six degrees freedom onto here because it's just going to rotate the just the lower legs. 
So essentially this pelvis joint will become a, a dummy dummy joint. And it's actually, it's this joint, the hips. So in here, what you do is you just right click on the hips and just do set root. And now Shogun knows to use that joint to apply six degrees of freedom to. And you can see that because in here, it's turned six degrees of freedom on for all the joints, as opposed to, um, you know, this joint, for example, which won't have um, translation on. So I hope that makes sense. The The next step is to um, set degrees of freedom. So it seems a bit hit and miss, but generally I think with FBXs, it's, they don't carry degrees of freedom across. Well, that's that's kind of what we've found. So it's just up to you to go in and, and set those degrees of freedom. So in this example, you know, it, it depends on your um, project and on your pipeline, but um, we fully support setting the degrees of freedom um, within the skeleton. Actually, on that point, there was a poll. Just, it'd just be interesting to know what your um, what what your rig setups are like, so, uh, particularly around um, roll bones. So, whether you would look to solve roll bones within um shogun or whether you deal with them further downstream so in the game engine or motion builder or whatever i should have put other as a fifth option maybe it's a So I'm just going to go and set degrees of freedom while that pole's running. Um, you don't have to worry about any um, secondary joints or leaf joints. Um, Shogun will take care of those. It will lock the degrees of freedom for you. So, for example, this rig's got all these toe joints in. Um, those won't. Once, once we go through this process, those joints won't get retargeted too. Um, but, you know, things like the toe, you're only gonna, that's a hidden joint. So we're gonna turn off degrees of freedom there. So that's interesting, yeah. So it's good to know people are looking for that feature within Shogun um it is supported so you can um like i say you can set degrees of freedom on the joint so like if i go in here this has a twist so in this example you could um just set degrees of freedom for y because you know it's a twist joint excuse that um and then when you create your, const or when you run the solver, it's only going to fit the twist rotation along that joint. And likewise for this joint, you would just limit it across um, X in this example, I think. I think another thing to consider is, um, you know, where you place that um, roll bone, does it go in the middle of the joint or does it go as the same location as the uh, as the parent, and yeah, I think in the interest of time, I think because I did cover this, I'm just going to go through and show you the, the basic steps. So here we have our two um, skeletons. We've obviously we've set our roots. So what we can do now is um, align the joints. That's a button gone. Um, I think a key important point here is you're not, um, so uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's why you wouldn't let me do it because I'm not in map mode. Um, we've kind of got this idea of map mode, which is a, it's not the base pose, so you're not affecting the, the, the base pose of the skeleton. 
but we kind of consider it as a retarget pose, retarget frame that you're going to create your constraints against. Now there's nothing stopping you from using the actual like live or, or captured frame to do that. Uh, you know, if you wanted to do that, you're free to uh, go in and, you know, position your skeleton against the uh, Vicon skeleton and so on, you know, rotate the joints and then create your constraints there. Or the other option is to use this map mode, which will position, which will set the skeletons into their base pose and allow you to retarget to them. And now we can see this aligned skeletons becomes available. And what that's tried to do is align the, the joint orient or the axis between the two skeletons. And you can see for this rig, it's just got it flipped. So in this example, what you'd need to do is to go in and rotate this. Like so. And again, for this pose, you're free to either modify your skeleton, the target skeleton, or mo modify the Vicon skeleton. So again, the I mean, that's really the rigging pose that's come in from the FBX, whereas this is the uh, like the base pose, so or, or a mixture of the two, really. What you're trying to do is get the um, two skeletons aligned correctly. And then we have this kind of target scale, which you can go up and down, and it's going to scale your characters, globally scale your characters. We're not changing bone lengths here, here at all. Interesting, it's the other way. So with mirror mode on, you can just rotate the joints down and so on. So you can see here that the, um, Again, the mesh the mesh has been changed because the um, we changed the base pose, but you can see how the spine of the target skeleton is kind of it's the opposite way around. Uh, but the retargeter should be able to cope with that; it shouldn't be a problem. Some other considerations when oh yeah, there you go, that's the wrong joint. You got to be careful if there's um, if there's other leaf joints in there, not not to be setting keys on them. But the idea is you, you kind of align the two skeletons like so, and then for the shoulders, try and get the hands to match nicely. And the key thing is you're really doing this per rig. So if you've got the same, if you're using human IK, you could, and you know that base pose coming in from human IK, you're only having to do this once across multiple characters. So in the interest of this demo, let's assume that's perfect. And then as I highlighted in the previous presentation, you basically go through here and you create uh, a mixture of position and rotation targets. So our recommendation is when well, you need a rotation target for each joint um, and then position targets on the hips, on the feet and on the hands are definitely worthwhile. Uh, I've had some success depending on if you've got like vastly different arm lengths setting position constraint on the top of the spine and I kind of that that can get good results it means that when you're trying to do say reach hands you're getting less you've got like an influence on the chest that's then pulling the position back um, and the, the key thing is once you've created all your constraints, then press prepare and use bones, and that's going to set any joints that haven't got mapping, or haven't got constraints built, it will set the degrees of freedom, it will turn them off. So essentially, it's not being considered by the solver, and that will vastly speed up the uh, retargeting process for you. So I'm just going to load in one I made earlier. Uh, try this one.
Uh, the, the button I forgot to say is the, the um, set map code here. So this is obviously before the retarget. Um, set map code will store the will store the pose, well, as it says, it seems easy, uh, for you so that you're, um, so you can then go back. And if you want to make any changes, you can just show the show the map pose and it'll snap the skeleton back into that pose. And there's one thing to consider, which is that stores the target skeleton. If you've made any changes to the Vicon skeleton, that gets stored in the VDF. So if you, if you take the uh, VSR, and load it into another file and then go into map pose it won't load in the uh, vicon skeleton into the into your map pose it'll only load in the target skeleton so it's just something to consider okay so now we've got our um, skeleton solved. Right, I'll have interactive solving. Go back to my retarget view. Turn on my skin. And now it's fit in the animation. I'm going to go back. It looks like I made a mistake, but again, in the interest of um, loading that file in, if I go back to here, Motion Builder, uh, yeah, like I say, this was thanks to the guys that in Exile. What we've got here is like a, a normal uh, Vicon device, which is streaming the data. We've got it set to Y up at the minute. Um, and what we've done is basically created the device. So you've got all your optical skeleton and it's using the um, prefix for your subject here. And what I've done is then taken the, um, I can show you, taken the sample um, character and just added the prefix to that character. So you add the subject name prefix to your FBX file and then save that out again. So you can see here, this is this is the FBX. There's no optical route connected to it. It's just got the prefix. And then for the file where you want to stream, you just merge in the uh, the FBX into your optical route. What that will do is it will just replace all the joints um, of your optical route with the correct character. And what this allows you to do is then stream directly onto the um, optical route. So you're not having to go through a secondary, um, you know, you don't know how to characterize two rigs, essentially, which I think can be really helpful. So if I go back to Shogun, I'm just going to load this file. This is the file you'll get along with the range of motion. This is just a take showing the sign language. Um, it's American Sign Language. I don't know if anyone knows American Sign Language, but it's she's saying nice to meet you. So this has had no, this is just a pure retarget, no additional animation. This is this is hopefully what you'd get using the um, catch creator character. And then if I go into Motion Builder, and connect. Take it off Control Rig. Oh, it's all going so well. You should see as the character start to move. Uh, strange. I 
Let me try that again. It was working. It shouldn't have got saved with the control rig. But, but I guess though that does show that you can take the you know, the idea is you can have one setup. So you can either have a real time setup where you're streaming directly onto the game character and you can then load FBXs in. Um, but they're both using the same rig and using the same um, control rig underneath, essentially. Uh, there's nothing driving it, so it doesn't need to be in any those. A2, why up? No, something's something's broken there, unfortunately. Um, you have to take my word for it, I'm afraid. Um, what was I going to say? The uh, yeah, the idea is being able to stream into Motion Builder, but in the future, we're kind of working with Relusion to be able to stream into iClone. So hopefully that'll be of benefit to some people. You know, the the rendering in iClone is just phenomenal. It looks it looks beautiful in this character particularly. Okay, shall we just run the final poll, Alicia? And then we can answer any questions. Maybe I'll be trying to, if anyone knows, if, if I'm missing something obvious in, in here, why well, it's not streaming. I've got, I've got multiple shavens open. So we have two questions left. The one live right now is, when retargeting, what rig skill can you use? Um, Feel free um, to answer that one. I should close my WhatsApp. So what I'm going to show is going back into Shogun Live. That's that one. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought as well. I think it's still, unfortunately, very few people can change the scale. We can't, we're not all making Naughty Dog games. So yeah, I mean, there's still a few people with the luxury of being able to scale their characters, which is obviously a nice benefit. Um, the, the workflow I showed was um, being able to globally scale, but there's nothing stopping you in a, you know, in a, what's the, if your pipeline can support it, you can change those bone lengths yourself. Um, you know, so you could get a proper, rather than you'd, you'd adjust the VSS and then you could also change the bone length. I guess I should say thanks to everyone for hanging around. <laughs> And been able to answer these questions. Uh, I don't know. So just to the results of that last one. Brilliant. Would you ever consider a character rig that could support joint scaling to allow stretch and compression? So in the future, great. Yeah, I think game engines are slowly adopting that ability. Um, it's definitely been on our roadmap for a while. And it's good to know that there's a large portion of people that are, that would like to see that. It, it would definitely help. Um, obviously, it's it's more data to solve and it's it's an extra layer of complexity to your game rigs or to, sorry to your rigs in general um but yeah I, I you know i think maybe one argument is could the solving skeleton support it even though the retargeting skeleton couldn't so that then at least things like the spine compression that i spoke about could be handled on a marker level and then ideally the road the um 
the retarget because you're essentially, you know, in the neck and the spine, you're just copying rotations. It could handle handle that a lot easier. And it looks like we have one question in the queue right now. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to drop them in. Um, I just wanted to highlight the that VSS that I modified. I'm about to share my screen. Um, you can save out that modified VSS, and if if you know which VST, let's say for that example, it's the production nine sides. What you can do is take the VST and rename it to match the VSS. So you know, in that example, it will be Celia. And then copy that into your model templates folder, and you can then use that use that pair of subjects for live subject calibration. And what that allow you to do is it will calibrate the VST to a VSK, but it will because there's no expressions in the VSS, those will get left alone. And it will just allow you to then you know each day of the shoot, slight marker changes will get updated with the VSK, but the actual modifications you made to the skeleton will maintain across the whole shoot. So we've got a question. Uh, if we had some custom constraints in our rigs, would it be possible to also write them for Shogun to fully support our rigs? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it depends what they are. I mean, there's there's a ton of flexibility in Shogun, right? You, there's nothing stopping you from uh, having additional bones or creating your own constraints, whether they're look at targets or um, position targets. Um, you know, you, you see, you know, amazing customers like I showed at the beginning with the um, with the tutorial with the um, the customer with the horse data, for example, being able to set up custom constraints like that. So I would hope that it would be within the realms of Shogun to support your rig. Yeah, but again, if you if you're happy to, it says anonymous. But if you're happy to email me and um, share the rig, then we can we can look at it in detail. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Oh, another one just came in. Yes, it's a, it's a great question. Um, in terms of marker setup for well, for labeling or, or solving, there's nothing stopping you from adding your own markers. I think if you're going down this kind of custom modification route, that's that's really straightforward, um, and I can send send through some details on how to do that. If you're looking to still calibrate your subjects using live subject, subject calibration in Shogun Live, uh, as long as the markers that you want to add or remove potentially fall within our uh, like Uber set, we call it, so the, the set that the training data was generated from, then you'll be able to, to use those subject models across both live and, and post. Um, but again, if you want to email me with um, like suggestions or if it's extra finger markers or if it's, uh, I don't know, like extra markers on the back or the front markers, then we can definitely look to support that in the future. I think we'd like to get to a point where um, we can kind of let you pick and choose. So we say, here's, here's the Uber set and here's this nice layout that says, these are all the markers. Here's the head. Okay, I only want four markers on the head. Here's the hands. Okay, I'm going to use... Uh, five for this day, and it will generate the model for you. Um, but for the time being, I think it's a it's a kind of case of contacting us, and we can we can see see about working together. Any other questions? Okay. Well, um, like I said, this is going to be on YouTube right after this, so you can rewatch or share it uh, with anyone who missed it. And then tomorrow um, at the same start time, you'll get an email from Zoom that has the link to the recording and then also to the presentation materials. So we'll put those together so you have them. 
Um, but if you have any questions, definitely email us at support at and it'll make it to the right person. Um, and we have another webinar next week on IMU with I Measure You, um, integrating the IMU sensors into Nexus. And then we'll have other webinars, um, panels, we're working on other content for the new year. So definitely stay tuned to our social channels um, and email me at marketing at Vicon if you're not on our customer newsletter list, because that's the first place that finds out about all of these events. But thank you guys for joining us. If there's not any other questions, I think we will leave it there. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for coming, guys. And um, I hope you found it useful. We're definitely going to be doing more of these in the future. Obviously, we're still stuck at home, so we're stuck in the shed. Um, so I, I think it's a great way of, of connecting. And like I say, any emails or chats you want out, outside of this, I appreciate talking about specific projects isn't always easy in a public forum. So just email me and we can go into more detail. But thanks. <laughs>